So I know we're all bright and early, ready, excited to learn about atmospheres of giant planets. Um, I know that I'm really excited to be here, um, especially particularly at this workshop. Um, I came to, I think, maybe the first Sagan workshop, like after the Michelson first Sagan workshop when I was in grad school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I was in the audience learning stuff, and um, then I was, I had the honor of being a Sagan postdoc, so the Sagan program has a very special place in my heart. Um, so I'm very excited to be back giving a talk here. Um, I'm also a little intimidated because atmospheres of giant planets is a little bit of a large topic. <laughs> so I'm going to do what I can, but I'm going to take the approach that many other people have taken, which is to kind of talk more broadly about more things so that you can then go look in more detail at whichever parts you might find interesting, want to learn more about, but to try to give you an idea of what I think are some of the important things you should know. Um, there are many different contexts in which we have atmospheres of giant planets because there are different contexts in which we have giant planets. In our own solar system, of course, we have the best known examples that we've been studying for a bit longer than all of the rest. Although some people in astronomy might be a little bit surprised at the fact that there are still some uh, kind of basic things we are still figuring out about those planets. I'm not going to talk about the solar system at all in this talk. Um, what I do mostly is study transiting planets, study hot Jupiter atmospheres and do three-dimensional <coughs> modeling. I'm going to talk almost not at all about that <laughs> because the point of this workshop are the directly imaged planets. Um, so I'm going to try to make sure to say things that are mostly relevant for the directly imaged planets, but an atmosphere is an atmosphere is an atmosphere. So there's quite a lot of overlap and things that are uh, kind of general across whatever you're looking at. Also, I think it's uh, worth mentioning, worth noting, oh, sorry, <laughs> that uh, Travis gave a wonderful talk yesterday, so you should you know, put that back in your memory and access it as I'm talking. Um, Travis lives and breathes directly imaged planets, and so he had some really nice things to say um, about you know, particular objects and about you know, gravity and clouds and all those kinds of things. Um, and I think that's kind of nicely complementary to the approach I'm going to take, but I'll reference that occasionally, so have it ready. Um, and he also did a nice job of pointing out that um, the atmosphere of a planet, it's what we're observing, and it's also related to the evolution of the planet because it's, it's the boundary condition. And so after me, Jonathan's going to give a nice talk about, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm sure it's nice, about the evolution of planets. So all these things tie together, so try to put them together in your mind. Okay, so atmospheres. Part of the reason I got excited about exoplanets and got into this field is because we're at a stage where we're not just detecting planets. <laughs> and I shouldn't say just, right? That's very impressive. <laughs> but after we detect planets, we also now get to actually characterize them. We get to know something about the conditions on the planet, something about their temperature, something about their composition. So it's more than just kind of an object that's there. It's an object that we get to know something about. And I find that exciting and inspiring. And it's funny, when I wrote this kind of detection slide thing, I was thinking about, you know, like radial velocity or transits, but <laughs> when you detect directly imaged planets, there's a little more complication. Like, do you know the mass or radius? Well, do you trust your models? How well do you trust them? Um, but the point is that once we start getting atmospheric information, we're learning about a lot more details. And so throughout this, though, you'll get the sense that there's this balance, right? We get to know about a lot more details, because a lot more details affect what we're observing. So it's, it's, it's more tricky because you need to include these things, but it's exciting because you have the chance to learn about these things. I have not thoroughly referenced all my slides. I've left out all sorts of things. So this is my excuse. <laughs> these are a few reviews that you can look at um, 
for more detail to look at the references for uh, these different uh, topics. And the exciting and wonderful and frustrating thing about this field is that it moves really fast. So the more recent the reference, the more useful. Because even this great reference from Protostars and Planets last summer, I'm sure, is already becoming out of date. But it's very good. It's a really good place to start. So check those out. OK, so if we're going to talk about atmospheres, let's start with the kind of simplest question. What is an atmosphere? Right? Um, what was that quote? It's the transition region between the interior and space. I liked that. I thought that's really nice and clever and true. But I, I'd like to think it's a little bit more than that, or you know, <laughs> it's not just this little slice. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna figure out what that means a little bit, and we'll start with the atmosphere that we all know and love. I would say at a gut level, but it's really more like at a lung level. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's early morning. You have to do what you can. <laughs> so of course. This is a nice little diagram of the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, as a theorist, those of us who think about atmospheres think about temperature profiles. So on the Earth, we have the temperature at the ground. And as you go higher into the atmosphere, it decreases. And this is to be expected. We do have this increase in the stratosphere, which I'm not going to talk about at all. And then it goes down again. And then it starts going up again. And this little useful text is telling you you have an ionosphere and a magnetosphere beginning there. Basically, that's saying this is where you're hitting space. right? This is where you're starting to interact with the solar wind and all these things. Basically, this is the end of the atmosphere, as far as I'm concerned. Now, there are people who study things like the evaporating atmospheres of hot Jupiters that are the very outer regions. And so they might take a little bit of issue with that. But for my purposes, I'm going to say that once you're starting to do that interaction, I'm going to call that the upper end of the atmosphere. And notice that also on this plot is the atmospheric pressure as a function of altitude. And it drops off really quickly. So you have one bar, the surface pressure. And then at Mount Everest, I guess it's 28% you know, of that. By the time we're at the top of the stratosphere, it's 0.1% of your surface value. So when we're getting up into these regions, we're also very, very tenuous. There's just very little material left in the atmosphere there. And I want to point out um, the pressure because we use altitude on the Earth because we have a surface that we're walking around on and mountains that we climb, and it's a very useful vertical coordinate. But for several reasons, um, pressure becomes a more useful vertical coordinate for gas giants. And you can see you know, it's dropping off. And through things like assuming hydrostatic equilibrium, you can translate between the two. And pressure becomes more useful in several ways. So for example, I talked about the upper edge of the atmosphere. but how do you define the bottom edge of an atmosphere when you don't have a surface? Because, of course, on these giant planets, they're basically gas all the way down, right? You might have a little core that's got some kind of ice and rock. So if you want like a solid surface, I guess maybe you could say that's it. But surrounding that is a whole bunch of metallic hydrogen um, because it's such high pressure and temperature. And so that's, there's no real like surface there, kind of, maybe. And it's very deep, right? You can look at some of these pressures. And an atmosphere is about a bar. And so this is very high pressure, very deep in the atmosphere. And then once we go farther out, we get to this layer of molecular hydrogen, kind of more normal stuff that we're used to. Um, but this is still very thick. You can see the transition here is at, uh, what, a few million bars. Um, so this whole thing is, I would not say, really is the atmosphere. The atmosphere is this tiny little layer at the very outer edge here, your transition region. Um, so let's, let's look at that a little bit in more detail and think what we want to say for the atmosphere. So here I'm showing a series of nice pressure temperature profiles um, from Jonathan 
And um, I really like this plot because it's showing you, again, the temperature profile as a function of pressure as your vertical coordinate. So this is high in the atmosphere. This is deep in the atmosphere. And it's showing you for a generic Jupiter-ish planet at a series of different separations from its host star, NAU. So, you know, out here you have like Jupiter and Saturn, and here you have the hot Jupiters. And so what you can see is that the structure of your atmosphere is going to change depending on the conditions in which you find the planet. Obviously, you have a much cooler atmosphere if you're farther from the star and a much hotter one if you're closer in. But more than that, here the thick lines are marking where the temperature pressure profile is convective. And you notice for these planets farther from the star, there's just this very thin, stably stratified region, above, uh, a convective zone that goes all the way down. So this is just a little shell on top of a huge amount of convection. Whereas once we get closer to the star, we've heated the upper atmosphere, you're pulling those profiles up, and so they remain stably stratified for a lot longer before you transition to the radiative convective, or convective zone at maybe a few hundred or a thousand bars, depending on your assumptions. And so this, this type of atmosphere is going to just be different in several important ways that I'm not going to talk about, <laughs> but I love very dearly, um, from these kinds of atmospheres. And so this connection, the rate of convective boundary, I would say is also not necessarily the best place to talk about uh, a bottom level, the atmosphere. Um, this is, you know, I'm, I call this a deep atmosphere, but it's in some ways importantly different, I would say, from the upper levels. So let's explore this a little more. I'm going to not really show much math, but try to give you a qualitative sense of how we get uh, pressure temperature profiles for giant planets. There's assumptions that go into them, and there's different levels of simplification you can use. But at the basic level, you have some amount of flux hitting the top of the atmosphere and getting absorbed as it goes down. And there's some amount of flux coming up from the bottom of the atmosphere. And this is because the giant planets have some internal heat left over from formation, differentiation. Um, doesn't really matter for these purposes. You have some amount of heat coming from the interior. Um, and so you've got flux going up, some amount of flux going down. And at the end of the day, you want all of your fluxes to be balanced such that you just have a net flux going up through the atmosphere. And this local radiative equilibrium is saying that at every point, your heating balances your cooling. Um, now, the fluxes are where it gets really complicated. <laughs> you have you know, your, your boundary conditions, and then you need to assume your opacities. And your opacities are going to be wavelength dependent, and your opacities are also going to depend on pressure and temperature. And you're trying to solve for temperature as a function of pressure. And so it gets um, very complicated or very simple if you choose to keep it simple. But there's this kind of interesting feedback because your opacities are governing your absorption, which means governing your heating. And your temperature profile is going to respond until you reach that equilibrium when you're solving for these. Um, it's also worth noting that your opacities, uh, your absorption coefficients, are kind of nicely related to your optical depth um, at some wavelength uh, as a simple relation with pressure, right? The higher pressure you go to, the higher optical depth, the higher opacity, the higher optical depth. Look, there's surface gravity in there, which Travis told you all sorts of wonderful things about, and I'm not going to mention again. Um, but you can kind of see a simple example of how this is expressed, right? If we compare the ends of these uh, distributions, 
we know that we have much more flux coming up uh, through the top boundary here. Otherwise, everything should be identical, our choices for the opacities. And so because you're dumping much more energy in here, and that's heating the atmosphere, it needs to be at a higher temperature so that you can radiate more efficiently and be in radiative balance. And notice that all of these opacities, all these choices, are going to depend also on your composition, what's actually in the atmosphere doing the absorbing. And so you're, this gives you a hint already that you're going to be learning something about that from whatever properties you're observing of this. And now we've actually kind of reached the point where I'm willing to give a sort of definition for the atmosphere. The upper boundary I already told you is kind of where we transition to space, where kind of the stuff of atmosphere runs out. I'm going to say that the atmosphere is basically the pressure range over which you're doing all of this heating, where your stellar radiation is being absorbed and where most of the action is happening in terms of the thermal re-emission and definitely the part where the emission to space is happening, the part that you're observing. Now this is kind of just my definition. This is, I didn't find this in a textbook somewhere, but this is what I like to think about in terms of what do we really mean when we're talking about an atmosphere. Okay, so <laughs> now the observers can, you know, whew, we got through the theory part of the talk. Um, what do we actually measure, right? We have these PT profiles, we have some assumption about composition. How does this relate to the actual things that we're measuring? Well, in exoplanet atmospheric measurements, be it transits or direct imaging, there's a few different things that we measure. Um, for transiting planets, we get a lot of information through absorption during primary transit when the planet passes between us and the star and you get light filtered through the atmosphere. I'm not going to talk about it because <laughs> it's not applicable to directly imaged planets. But common to both types of observation is that we're observing emission from the planet and we're observing reflection from the planet. Um, those observations happen differently. For transiting planets, we have to use the geometry of the situation whereas for directly imaged planets, we're actually spatially resolving the planet. But in either case, those are the things we're measuring, and those things come from our models of the atmosphere, or actually the physical atmosphere, <laughs> and the pressures and temperatures and opacities that we're thinking about. At the simplest level, this is fairly obvious, right? You're going to get more emission from a hotter object, but you should already realize there's not really a temperature of the planet, right? You can define an effective temperature, an equilibrium temperature, but it's a temperature profile. There's a range of temperatures, and so our emission is a little bit more complicated than just a temperature. So let's talk a little bit about some of this complication. We need to, once we're thinking about the fact that we're measuring at different wavelengths, we may have different things in the atmosphere, we need to pay a little bit more attention to what these opacities actually mean. So this is a nice plot showing um, absorption cross-section as a function of wavelength for several common uh, molecules that we might find in a planet's atmosphere. Now you might remember a little bit of Travis's talk, talking about uh, chemical disequilibrium and that's true and important, and I'll return to that. But usually when you're modeling, it's good to start with the simplest models that you can and then add complexity as necessary or motivated by the data. So a first step in terms of knowing which molecules to put in your model for these opacities is you know something about the temperature and pressure, you've assumed something about the composition, abundances, and you can calculate for chemical equilibrium what you think the most common species are. But that's not in the full picture, of course, because you know hydrogen and helium don't really show up here. Um, so it's a combination of what's common and what's wrongly absorbing at your wavelengths of interest. So you notice these are kind of some nice wavelengths of interest in terms of where you're actually going to be observing this emission, where you expect the strongest emission, that kind of thing. Um, so you can see that for a given molecule, you have some nice pattern 
have absorption. And it's dependent, though, on the particular temperature and pressure that you're choosing. And this gets really complicated really fast. Um, some of these profiles are very dependent on temperature, some of them a little bit less dependent on temperature, depending on the which wavelength part you're looking at, which pressure. So once you're getting into the nitty gritty of observations, planning observations, interpreting observations, you need to look at these kinds of details, make sure you understand what's going on. But I'm not going to say any more about that. Instead, I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of how, as a theorist, I can think about what we're learning from a set of data. So here I'm showing the emission spectrum for a hot Jupiter. I know it's not a directly image planet, but these are the papers I read. So here was a nice recent one with some nice plots, so I used it. And it's the same idea, right? You're going to have emission from a planet. So here, uh, for transiting planets, we measure it as a ratio relative to the stellar flux, and here's the wavelength. And there's a whole bunch of wonderful, beautiful data points all along here, which is great. I want you to pay attention to the fact that there are three different lines plotted on here, which are three different models. Um, the details aren't important at the moment. There's a black curve, which has some features in it, and this yellow dashed curve, which also has some features in it. And there's also this dotted line, which is an isothermal model. So this is basically the black body curve at some temperature relative to the stellar flux. And so you can see that there's a lot of agreement between our models and an isothermal atmosphere um, at a lot of the wavelengths, but then there's some deviation at some of points, especially here at 4.5 microns. So these models, the black and yellow ones, correspond to some pressure temperature profile, right? So here they are. Again, we have pressure. This is deep in the atmosphere, high in the atmosphere. We have temperature. And we have our two different models. And you notice that in both models, we're isothermal up to some pressure level, and then it starts decreasing. And the two different models have two different pressure places where they transition from being isothermal to decreasing. And our isothermal model isn't plotted here, but you can see that it's, you know, would just be a straight line at this value a little bit less than 3,000. So it's important that we have these kind of nice simple profiles, because it helps us understand this a little more. Um, and there's this nice difference here in pressure. So I'm going to put more plot, uh, lines on this slide, more information. So I want to warn you before your eyes go crazy. What I'm going to show you next are contribution functions for these two different models. Now remember, when we're solving for a temperature profile, we're solving for all the fluxes up and down through the atmosphere at each point, at each wavelength. And so for something like photometric observation, you can integrate over those wavelengths and calculate where the flux is coming from in the atmosphere, the pressure regions that that wavelength is probing. And so that's what I'm going to show you, a whole bunch of lines for all these different data points. Don't worry about all the lines. One of these is for one of the models. The other of these is for the other model. And in each case, I've marked for you the important bit that I want you to pay attention to, which is where that model transitions from being isothermal to the temperature decreasing. And so notice, for example, if we look at the one where I've marked it with light gray, this uh, particular model, all of the contribution functions, almost all of them, for all of these different data points, are down in these pressure regions. And so all of these wavelengths according to this model's interpretation, are probing the isothermal region of the atmosphere. Similarly, for this model, again, all of these curves but one are sitting down at these pressure levels below our, uh, well into our isothermal region. And in both cases, there's kind of one single wavelength, the 4.5 micron band, 
where the contribution function is occurring at lower pressures, higher in the atmosphere. And so in both these models, this wavelength is probing a lower temperature, and so the data are lower there than our isothermal model. We're seeing a cooler region, we're seeing less emission. Now, it's worth noting that these two different models are different. They're saying we're probing different pressure regions. They have different compositions. And so you have different opacity sources. You expect them at different regions. Things get complicated fast. But you can start to at least get a handle on the different possibilities of how to interpret a mission like this from a planet. And at the base, most basic level, you're seeing different depths into the atmosphere at different wavelengths. And so you're learning something about that temperature profile, although it might be a little bit difficult to disentangle exactly what that means. But the information is there. OK. Oh, clouds. <laughs> clouds make everything more complicated. Uh, unfortunately, they're really important, and we can't get around it. We know that they affect our observations, and so we have to include them. Um, but it's hard. It's really hard. So at the simplest level, um, clouds happen when you have your temperature pressure profile cross a condensation curve. And so at that point, you expect a phase change and for there to be clouds. Um, here are several profiles for different types of objects from the sun, M dwarfs, L dwarfs, T dwarfs, and Jupiter, with a few different condensation curves plotted. And nice little cartoons showing you that there's where the cloud forms, both that you expect a cloud to form on L dwarfs and the pressure and temperature at which you expect it to form. Except that that's not really how clouds form. It's a little bit more complicated. You have to worry about how Things are moving up and down, crossing these condensation curves. You have to worry about the vertical extent of the cloud. Um, you have to worry about if it's crossing a couple times, what does that mean exactly? You have to worry about, in terms of the properties of the clouds, you need to worry about um, particle sizes in your clouds and the distribution of particle sizes and whether that's constant throughout your atmosphere or changes depending on where you are in the atmosphere. So very quickly, the details get very gross <laughs> and hard to model. There are, there are good ways to model, there are clever ways to model, and different people take different approaches. Um, but there's a lot of complexity, and you have to decide how you're going to include that. And however you decide to include it, it's going to change your rate of transfer. Um, this is a nice little cartoon for the Earth showing you that when you have clouds, the light coming in can be reflected. That's one effect on your rate of transfer and on your heating of the atmosphere. But also, your thermal emission will also interact with the clouds. It can absorb the thermal emission, create a nice little blanket, and keep us warm on Earth. Um, but this will also depend on the height of the clouds. Um, the temperature of the clouds is going to change kind of its emission. Again, the particle sizes, blah, 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 on and on. <laughs> really complicated. Um, so, you need to, in your model, include uh, treatment of clouds if you expect that you're going to have them because you know there's some nice condensation curve appropriate to the object you're considering about. Um, so, you need to include them. And in your prescription, you, let's say you solve for your temperature pressure profile. You look for where it crosses condensation curves. You say, okay, I'm going to add some clouds with some properties. You recalculate your fluxes based on what you've chosen for what the cloud should do. That means your heating rates are going to change, which means your temperature structure had to adjust to try to come into equilibrium. That might shift your profile and shift exactly where the clouds are and what's going on with them. And so typically, the way this is done is it kind of iterates back and forth until you reach a solution that self-consistently has the clouds and has their influence on the rate of transfer. And if it's influencing the rate of transfer and influencing the atmospheric structure of the planet, uh, that means it's also influencing our observables, right? So one kind of obvious 
thing we think about in terms of clouds is reflection, because we look at images of the Earth and we see these bright white clouds. And that's really important. And not something I want to talk about in detail. I encourage you to go look at more references if you're interested. I'm including a nice couple of pretty diagrams from a paper that Carrie Hoy did when she wasn't you know, building cool instruments. And I like this plot here. It's a little bit complicated, but I think it kind of nicely shows what clouds are doing in an atmosphere. So in this case, you have a Jupiter-like planet at several different separations from its host star. So you know, close in, farther out, a little bit farther out, much farther out. And pressure is shown on the vertical coordinate. So higher in the atmosphere, deeper in the atmosphere, showing the wavelength horizontally. And then the color is giving you the logarithm of the optical depth. So you can pay attention to the yellow region, which is your optical depth unity. And so you can see in this, for this uh, planet, we don't expect, based on these models, for any clouds to form. And so your optical depth is kind of just a function of the molecular absorption going on. And you see all those features here and some scattering of shorter wavelengths. Now, farther from the star, though, you form uh, a water cloud, water and ammonia, and they happen at different heights depending on what's going on with your pressure temperature structure. And this changes your optical depth. This changes what's going on um, in terms of photons entering and exiting the atmosphere. So I think it's kind of a nice view into the atmosphere, a nice way of looking at it a little bit. More observationally, though, you can calculate things like your albedo as a function of wavelength at some given resolution and the different types of behaviors you expect, whether you think there should be little features or not and what resolution you might need to get those. There's you know, lots of interesting things in this paper and also in this field in general about um, what you might expect in terms of reflected light from a planet and the many different complications that go in there. Again, it's things like what's in the atmosphere, your composition, what you're assuming about opacities. Um, so you can start to constrain it and look at how it affects observables. And if it's affecting observables, then you need to include it, but it also means you get to learn something about it from the observables. So um, also clouds affect emission, right? You're changing your pressure temperature profile, which means you're changing where the emitted light is coming from. Um, Travis talked a lot about this, so I don't think I'm going to spend much time on it. Uh, you know, he pointed out that you have, for these brown dwarfs, you have cloudy and clear atmospheres. The directly imaged planets are showing this interesting kind of difference in what's going on with the clouds and the clearing, and there's really lots of interesting things to go on with here. but. Um, I'm just going to remind you of it and encourage you to look up his talk, look up other references. Okay, so I have a little bit of time left. So now I get to talk about more physics, more complications, um, which again is nice. As you add more complexity, maybe you can observe some of these things. And the first complication I'd like to talk about is that planets are not 1D. Turns out. So in all of these and all of the talks so far have talked about these temperature profiles as if there's one temperature profile for the entire planet. But as we know from our own experience walking around the Earth, temperatures vary from place to place around the planet. And we expect this to happen to some degree on planets as well. Um, my favorite hot Jupiters, these are actually some observations mapping out a difference in flux from different regions of the planet. And we can do this in simulations as well. For Jupiter, you see differences around the planet. It's important to consider what this spatial variation can do to your observations, what kind of spatial variation you might expect, and how it might be important, and when it might be important. When you have spatial variation, that means you also need to think about atmospheric circulation. Because if you have one part of the planet that's hotter, and one part of the planet that's colder, and it's gas, you're going to have gas flowing from hot to cold to try to decrease these gradients. And it's a lot more complicated than that in detail. And I encourage you, if you're interested, to look up a couple of reviews 
um, explaining both kind of how the process works, explaining some nice modeling going on, including my own, of course. Um, and this, this is mostly focused on hot Jupiter so far because hot Jupiters are what we've measured mostly so far. And also hot Jupiters had this really intense situation where you expect a strong difference between your day side and your night side. Maybe it doesn't matter so much for directly imaged planets because they're so very far from the star. And so when you're thinking about back to the 1D temperature pressure profile, you know, you're, you're, instead of being dominated by the flux coming from the top, you're dominated from the, by the flux coming out from the planet. So maybe it should be more uniform. So maybe you don't have to worry about this so much, but you need to think about it. Um, the kind of ways that you can get this non-uniformity expressed in observations is, you know, flux emitted differently from different parts of the atmosphere because you have your temperature pressure profiles being bent around by the winds. You're no longer in radiative, local rate of equilibrium for any vertical profile because your heating can be non-zero. Your heating and cooling can be non-zero at any location because you have winds transporting energy around as well. Um, if you have a whole bunch of different temperature pressure profiles from this nice paper by Barman, um, this is a nice demonstration that you can have be crossing different um, condensation curves at different points around the planets. You might have situations where you have clouds, for example, forming in one part of the planet at one depth, the winds moving them around somewhere else where they might dissipate, maybe clouds at a different depth. It can get, again, very complicated very quickly, but fun. <laughs> I like this complication because it gives you, if it has observable consequences, it gives you another way to learn a little bit more about the planet's atmosphere depending on things like how you're viewing it, how it might be rotating, whether you have big storms coming and going. Um, I also want to make sure to mention that uh, we can do nice comparisons of 3D models with 1D models and look at the observables and see whether they're very different or not so that we know whether we can use 1D models, which is great because they're a lot simpler and a lot easier to explore kind of observational degeneracies or whether we need to include 3D models and maybe we can use the 1D models but figure out how to kind of include the effects of 3D in them. So there's really good stuff to study there and the answer is in many cases 1D models are actually really good. We just need to understand why that's the case and once that's the case. Um, Travis talked a lot about this and I think it's worth emphasizing <laughs> we should not expect chemical equilibrium. There's vertical mixing going on, and there may well be horizontal mixing going on as you're blowing things around the planet. And this means that uh, you might have one molecular species that's in equilibrium here, but it gets blown here, and our time scale for conversion might be longer than the time it took to get it there, and so you can have species out of equilibrium. Vertical mixing, um, this is kind of just to remind me to tell you about it. You can look up a lot more information about it elsewhere. But for example, these purple curves, the solid line and the dashed line are models with or without vertical mixing, with or without assuming local chemical equilibrium. And you can see that your um, abundance can vary by orders of magnitude. And this means your opacities will be changing very strongly as well, which is how it affects observations. The dark secret about vertical mixing is that it's really hard to model what it actually should be. So usually this is a knob that's put in without a lot of good guidance. It's a really important knob. It should be put in and explored the effects, but it's very difficult to know actually what that value should be. So, you know, dirty laundry. Let's air it. Okay. Um, Okay, I think I have time to talk about like one, one slide, one slide of bonus material, which is that atmospheres can let us know even a little bit more than just about the atmosphere itself. For example, we might be able to know about the planet's rotation, which I think is super exciting. And I can't believe, Travis, you mentioned this result yesterday, I think to say there was detection of CL, is it, in this planet? And you didn't say that we also detected rotation which I think is like the coolest part. I don't even know if it was CO, so you can see how different people care about different things. But the point is, 
this was very high resolution spectrum of this uh, planet and the dotted line is the width that you would expect from just kind of the instrument and their model and they s there's this significant amount of extra broadening um, really um, well established measurement this this is rotating really 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 quickly and you're learning that because the planet has these um, absorption lines that are getting broadened, right? And so the atmosphere is giving you more information about the planet. Um, and I've thought some about how you could do this for hot Jupiters too, which I think is really exciting and cool. So we're going to flip to the end. What I've told you is that atmospheres are exciting because we move from detecting these amazing planets to learn something about the properties on them. You can start to build kind of simple models of the atmosphere and learn something about what's going on. The more detail you observe, the more complication you need to include, but the more physical properties you might be able to measure. We measure them in several different ways, have to include several different added bits of complexity, and it's a fun and exciting field. You should all come join me in it. Thank you. Um, why were the emission curves for the isothermal model not actually black body curves? And um, it's because what was plotted was not just flux from the planet, it was flux from the planet divided by flux from the star, because that's the actual quantity that you're measuring. Yeah, good question. So the question was, am I familiar with uh, methods of measuring polarized light and the extra detail uh, information you can get from that? The short answer is, no, I'm not very familiar with the <laughs> extra messiness of polarized light, because then you need not just your reflecting material, but also the kind of polarization properties of all that, and that's an extra level of um, complication. But it is true that that is another type of observation you can do that can give you even more of a handle on what's going on in the atmosphere, because um, there you're saying not just that you have some amount of reflection, but you also have some more information about what's doing the reflection based on polarization. Um, so I don't really know more than that that I can tell you, but there, again, are some interesting things being done there. Um, people working very hard to uh, kind of develop that type of measurement. Right now I'd say that polarization measurements are still kind of in the baby steps and have been done as far as I'm aware, mostly for transiting planets, and there you worry a lot about contamination from the star. Because if you have some kind of uh, activity on the star, you might get weird interactions. And I don't know, I don't really know. <laughs> so, so the hot Jupiter, the question was about the hot Jupiter HD 189733b um, and the type of measurements for that. And that is like the poster child of hot Jupiters because it's one of them with the highest signal to noise and there's all sorts of information about that. Um, uh, yes, we have lots of wavelength information. We have phase curves for that planet. So the maps I showed you about the brightness distribution, um, those are for that particular planet. Um, so that's one of the hot Jupiters that we know the most about. Um, and actually, clouds might be important <laughs> on that planet too um, in transmission. The absorption that I didn't talk about, um, you can s there's kind of this flat profile for that planet that tells you there's something in there that you need to worry about.